Welcome, everybody, to our discussion panel held by our Justice Craft Collective on critical perspectives on justice and political change in times of uncertainty. As you know, our event is part of this timely and very important conference entitled Global Anthropocene, organized by the Philippines International Studies Organizations, or FISO. And in the name of our collective, I'd like to thank the organizers, especially Nasif Mambilang Adyong and his fantastic team um, at FISO here for putting together a free virtual event that is continuously fueling important debates on contemporary issues in the academic and professional front lines. Secondly, I'm also very grateful for my fellow justice crafters, as I'd like to name them, from our collective to be part of this round table and put forward cutting edge and innovative ideas to help better understand the world we live in and seek holistic solutions. In an epoch during which the significant human impact on our Earth ecosystems, including, but of course not limited to anthropogenic climate change, it is high time to reflect on a variety of issues associated with this topic. Thus, reminiscent of David Chandler and Jonathan Pugh's recent work entitled Anthropocene Islands, which puts the island at the forefront of Anthropocene debates, we also highlight the importance of the island as an imaginary concept that helps us understand and connect a variety of thematic issues geographically and conceptually speaking. With our panel today, we thus hope to explore some answers related to better understanding global injustice, particularly during times of change and times of uncertainty. Before jumping into some of the issues our collective grapples with, however, let me offer a few words to introduce the collective to you. In a nutshell, our Justice Craft Collective is a loose network of like-minded individuals, including scholars, practitioners, but also advocates, to address contemporary injustices and past wrongdoings, drawing on transdisciplinary perspectives and cross-regional analyses. The impetus for forming and fueling such an international research community, but also a collaboration, grew out of the need to particularly look at transitional justice issues from an alternative and more holistic perspective, including transformative potentials of communities and societies. This in turn can only be achieved by critically exploring stakeholders, the spaces different social groups interact and meet, and by highlighting the various struggles and the impact diverse actions have on varying varying levels, including the local, the national, the regional, and the global. With our roundtable discussion today, we thus invite you to join us in our journey, exploring different facets of some of these pressing issues. And while we're not have the opportunity to delve into all of our work, due, of course, the time constraints and unfortunately the absence of some of our members, We'd still like you to offer the following space-related elaborations to our present members. We use here a metaphorical description, which we'll get into more detail later as we um, go through the presentations. First, before we will start with sort of the um, the stage, which is our conceptual framework, which I'll give you a brief overview in just a, a minute. And this is then followed by the section called the effect. Um, by Eliza Garnsey at the University of Cambridge. And um, she looks at the sort of the emotive spaces and, um, and art with regards to justice, followed by the uprising, which um, ties in sort of social movement um, ideas and of course sort of resistance, resilience um, in the realm of transitional justice by Lauren Belasco from Stockton University. And um, last but not least, uh, the audience, by um, Chris Lamont from Tokyo International University, 
who looks at sort of more informal spaces with regards to um, injustices and, and wrongdoings. After we hear from Chris, I'll close with a few remarks on the significance of mapping um, related to digital methods and data visualization in the field uh, before then turning to our here esteemed audience for a brief Q&A session. That said, let me now begin with an overview of our conceptual framework for our work that explores then a variety of different spaces. Let us begin hence um, with sort of what I mentioned earlier, the metaphorical space of the stage. And with my brief remarks that follow, I hope so to set the stage for some of my colleagues' reflections on these aforementioned spaces. I'd like to start here with the concept of change. Social, political, and cultural shifts in our society are organic processes which occur incrementally. These shifts, however, do not necessarily unfold in a linear fashion, sometimes are situated in more radical demands for change. Early research, for instance, has really stressed the teleological presuppositions and outcomes of change. And um, thus, we're heavily focused on rational choice perspectives. And these theories of change are thus, first and foremost, impact oriented, which can certainly be problematic. And what's lacking here is to grasp a deeper meaning of change due in part to this continued output driven research and, and knowledge production. We here in the collective thus suggest a more boundary bending paradigm shift. We need to change our analytical focus away from outcome and actor centric evaluations. And instead we ought to study really the significance of struggles for change. We can do so by observing various processes across different time periods, but also contexts. These struggles are all instrumental in fueling processes of political change. Embracing a different conceptual lens thus allows for better understanding of the dynamic and transformative relationship between actors, contexts, and struggles, all in the name of justice. So the way we seek justice then and go about it varies depending on who is involved and where it takes place and when, of course, it occurs. Consequently, we here at the collective conceive of transitional justice practices as a fluid space-time continuum. It is antithetical to the embedded temporal and spatial limits implicit in post-conflict and post-authoritarian justice efforts in which transitions are conceived with an aim to end injustice. And also questions to spatial boundaries and limitations of justice and injustice. Hence, our framing allows us to question how knowledge about and practices of political change travel across spatial and temporal borders and eventually are translated and transformed by our societies. The significance of this framing lies in how it makes transitional justice more receptive to recognizing situated struggles and claims for justice, which is an essential task for comprehend, comprehending the injustices, which are the long-term causes oftentimes of conflict. This, of course, in turn highlights the centrality we accord to the notion of space in our intellectual inquiries. And um, some of the more recent scholarship has grappled and centered on memory studies and aspects of peace building, in particular around speciality or space. And I'm notably referring here to um, research on so called in between spaces, which refer to important but lesser explored areas in the field. Born from spatial analysis then accomplishes two goals. First, it allows for dynamic understanding of space, which advances other claims in terms of agency, power and representation, and of course, temporality. Second, 
it also creates a common language between different forms of research, thus highlighting the creation and evolution of ideas, which Donna Haraway referred to as situated knowledges. As a result, our notion of space oscillates between physical locations and imagined social constructs, informal and formal venues, as well as, as I mentioned earlier with Eliza's work, emotive and rational thoughts, which materialize into different forms of spatial patterns and, and structures. We argue hence that transition of justice practices not only happen in these institutionally and formal spaces that exist and which have defined the field of study in the past, but also in the inside out, the outside in, and the so-called in-between spaces. Let me now say a few words on the concept of struggles. The struggle for change which occur in these spaces originate and develop to individuals and within groups, hence underscoring the important role of agency during such processes. Agency is complex and multi-layered, of course. It raises questions about who gains access to means that fuel change, and more specifically about representation and whether recognition within society requires passage through formal institutions in order to gain legitimacy. Transitional justice practitioners, for instance, are often portrayed as rational expert with technical knowledge, but this portrayal calls for critical reflection on how legitimacy forms in terms of existing knowledge and the creation of new knowledge in the field. Who gets to claim legitimacy? How is it perceived by whom and ultimately who approves it? And what are the consequences of these dynamics? Like the small number of scholars who have scrutinized this process, we urge also for more autonomous alternative forms of representation. At the heart of our framework is thus Ines Valdez's understanding of justice as a political craft, which allows us to uncover events that are unintelligible to existing frameworks. In other words, political change emerges out of struggles for justice, which occur in alternative spaces under discussion. The notion of justice as a political craft allows us to pay attention to political activity by a variety of actors in different political areas. Hence, by exploring the interplay between space, the passage of time, agency, and power, we here at the collective uncover the political craft of justice and change or justice craft, how we'd like to call it, which can be defined as situated struggles by individual and collective stakeholders for political change fueled by a dialectical justice-driven narrative and practice across different physical and symbolic spaces. In our work thus, we explore six physical and symbolic spaces, the island, the body, the effect, the uprising, and the audience, and finally the map, some of which I told you earlier will be explored by my colleagues. If we were to take a metaphoric liberty, our conceptual framework could be visualized as a tree. And one of the three are the roots, which absorb and transport situated knowledge. That is the potential or positional perspectives which determine what is possible for us to know and see among different branches, the physical and symbolical spaces which we analyze in our work. Knowledge thus emerges from these spaces and these spaces make permissible and comprehensible different knowledge. The root in our true metaphor are the methodological approaches which we come to our analysis. They're a way of understanding that what we hear, see and say in and about these spaces is simultaneously situated in and constitutive of those spaces. Thus, we are challenging epistemological and ontological assumptions of what political change is and what it can be. In the middle of the tree is the trunk which supports and distributes claims to representation between situated knowledges, which we call sort of the soil and different spaces, which were the branches. These claims to representation are made and received 
in an iterative process. In other words, political presentation is an ongoing process of claim making and claim receiving rather than a fact established by institutional election or selection. It's a circle and performative relationship between the represented and the representative. At the top end of the tree is the foliage, which gives overarching form to our conceptual framework, sheltering the branches, the spaces within it. This form is the political craft through which we can imagine and contest different organizations of the world. It is our hope that this metaphor of the tree elucidates how it is possible to conceive of global injustice and the struggles against it as deeply interconnected. What may on first glance appear as disparate spaces are actually integral parts of one organism. The political change or changes therefore we seek to map across space and time occur via an iterative process of political representation which emerges from different situated spaces. Spaces which ongoing conflict and struggles against injustice compel us to take seriously. With this cursory overview, we'll now turn it over to the first space, the effect by my dear friend and colleague, Eliza, where she iterates on sort of emotive spaces, drawing on art and its relationship to justice. Eliza, I'm glad to be with you tonight or this morning, this afternoon. It's very late over here in Brooklyn. Um, floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Arno, and thank you so much um, to everyone. It's great to see so many um, participants um, coming into the roundtable. So this is really wonderful. Um, so by way of building on the conceptual framework, which I know is outlined, I'm going to discuss uh, one of those alternative spaces which you touched upon. Um, and it's one of those spaces in which we can look to understand struggles for political change and explore actually what kinds of political claims are being made out of these spaces. So as I know mentioned, the space I'm going to talk about is that of affect. And really by affective spaces, I mean the emotional and the mental spaces of justice, uh, the feelings uh, and the memories which surround conflict and repair. So as a collective, we suggest that these effective spaces are really incredibly important. Um, and they're important because the process of political change um, is really inseparable from feelings of justice. And that is justice is not done unless it's also seen, it's also felt, uh, and it's also thought to be done or to be achieved. So in order to, to really kind of grapple with and understand these effective spaces, um, but also in, in kind of coming to terms uh, with past conflict and strengthening democratic institutions in the aftermath of conflict, we propose that, that art and um, creative responses play a really important role in communicating, but also in creating um, these kind of effective topologies of justice in order to recognize um, really diverse and often competing claims for recognition because art can provoke us to travel um, into another's world, really thinking and feeling our way into their universe. And this recognition is essential uh, in order to comprehend, um, but also respond to the claims of people who have been affected either indirectly or, or directly and individually and collectively um, by conflict and violence. And so in this way, artistic interventions um, offer an alternative space of justice. And the significance of artistic interventions really exists not only in their creation, um, but in the different effective responses uh, they provoke, which, which can change with the passage of time and change um, with different spaces and in different contexts. And these play a, an important role um, in animating, but also in, in activating the kind of narratives of individuals so that they take on the collective importance which contributes to, to political change. And so... Um, in, in kind of that broad outline of artistic inventions, I really want to bring up um, a case study example of one artwork uh, which we explore in, in our collective piece. So I'm just going to quickly share my screen um, to show you an example of this artwork. 
There we go. Okay. So what's on the screen is a set of tapestries um, and it's entitled The Benefit of the Doubt by the artist Marlene Dumas. And these tapestries were gifted by Dumas and the Dutch government uh, to South Africa. So one set of these tapestries currently hangs inside the Hall of Justice, which is a largely administrative court in the town of Den Bosch in the Netherlands. And the other set hang inside the Constitutional Court of South Africa uh, in Johannesburg. And the Constitutional Court is, is really the most significant institution to emerge out of South Africa's transition from apartheid uh, to democracy. So we analysed really how the, the transnational exchange of the, these tapestries, um, their content, but also the, the spatial location uh, in which they hang and really the effective responses um, which they provoke have really important implications for the provision of justice in both contexts. And this is especially in relation to post-apartheid uh, political transition um, and the post-colonial relations between the two countries. So the, the tapestries, um, they depict eight, eight uh, close-up human faces. Um, and these faces, which you can see on the screen, surround a, a central childlike figure who's intended to embody liberty. So in the Netherlands, um, the benefit of the doubt kind of physically and psychologically looms large um, over the, the quite small courtroom in which it hangs. And this is pictured um, on the left of the screen. So it's, it's described by people um, who frequent the court um, as monsters, as dead bodies, as skeletons. Um, and these figures really um, appear to create a somewhat somber atmosphere um, within the court. And this atmosphere, what's really interesting is, has a really direct um, impact on the operation of the court. Because this particular courtroom inside the Hall of Justice was originally intended um, to be used as a courtroom for family law matters. But the decision was actually taken to, to move um, the, the family law matters, not the artworks, to move the actual cases into another courtroom. Um, as the court staff received complaints that the tapestries really scared the children uh, who attended uh, the courtroom as part of their, uh, these family law hearings. And so by contrast, you have, you know, uh, the same set of tapestries, it's twin, hanging inside the Constitutional Court of South Africa. Um, and these hang at ceiling height in a public art gallery, which is outside the main court chamber. So this is pictured on the right of the screen. So the tapestries in this context kind of soar above the heads of viewers um, and they're slightly shrouded in dimmed lighting and they really invite a very different sense of contemplation. So in, in the context of the Constitutional Court of South Africa, um, the tapestries are perceived by people at the court um, to reflect the importance of humanity, um, both in the moral responsibility of humans to each other and in the creative energy um, of being human. So the space um, of these courts, but also the different ways in which the tapestries are exhibited in the Netherlands and in South Africa, really directly um, affect the interpretations of the benefit of the doubt um, and the, the feelings that these tapestries provoke um, in the different contexts. And I should just, I, I, I want to just say that kind of getting to the, the kind of the perceptions and interpretations that people have of these works um, is based on um, lengthy periods of field work. So that's kind of where the data uh, perspective is coming from. I just wanted to mention that. Um, but what's also interesting about the tapestries is, is they're particularly significant for the kind of the political relationship that they embody and that their exchanges, uh, the exchange between these two courts embodies. Because the artwork um, becomes embedded in kind of the political structures of former Dutch colonial rule in South Africa and their influence on successive um, South African governments. The, the tapestries, in, in some sense, seem to linger inside the Constitutional Court of South Africa almost as if the kind of the Dutch government, um, as the title suggests, is really asking for the benefit of the doubt. So international relations also seep into the court um, through Dumas' artwork, um, implicating 
I think both the deliverance of justice in South Africa it, in a wider political circle. Um, so I'd like to kind of end, end my look at this alternative space by saying that without art, uh, transitional justice will really fail to fully comprehend, but also respond to the injustices, which are the long-term causes of conflict and thus rendering political change uncertain. So the justice craft, um, as I know, as I know outlined, the narratives and practices of political change, um, which is highlighted in the benefit of the doubt, really shows how artistic interventions can provide alternative spaces of justice by engaging different effective responses, um, both at individual and national levels. And so these are responses um, which is I'm going to hand the baton over to Lauren right now, is going to talk about th these are responses which can have um, really pervasive uh, consequences. And I'll stop sharing my screen on that note. Thank you so much, Eliza. Um, so for uh, my remarks, I'd like to focus on some of the recent protests that have been happening in the Americas. Uh, in recent years, prevailing demands for justice have connected dispossessed citizens across the Americas. Popular uprisings and mass demonstrations confront the state to call attention to the racialized violence, uh, physical violence and structural violence long endured by Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Protesters in Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, and the United States, and that's just to name a few, are contesting the entrenched economic and social inequalities that divide elites from the rest of society, the political arrangements that have consolidated them, and the legacies of enslavement and imperialism underpinning these structures. Citizens are questioning both the performance and the legitimacy of their democracies and the larger neoliberal projects in which they are embedded. So as demands for a new social contract intensify, the discourse of transitional justice has entered the conversation. And as some have used this moment to reflect on the fragilities and limitations of transitional justice, others have suggested that TJ can serve as an impetus for strengthening democracies. And further, these uprisings are occurring in countries that have had experience with transitional justice, um, yet their contemporary political and social contexts still qualify to meet the very circumstances, or as Colleen Murphy describes, the conditions that must be in place for justice to be useful, uh, which include pervasive structural inequality, normalized collective and political wrongdoing, serious existential uncertainty, and fundamental uncertainty about authority. So an immediate question arises, uh, how should we situate the current societal demands for a deeper transformative justice within a country's past and present experience with transitional justice? So uh, for, for today, I'd like to suggest the theory of change along of what Justice Craft is working on to explain how agents of justice are envisioning a new social contract through their engagement with past and present uh, TJ processes. And the theory's departure point are the specific encounters civil society actors have with transitional justice and peace building. And through mechanisms of resistance, reclamation, and resilience, transformative justice initiatives and practices are emerging um, as part of this new demand for a social contract with the state that address political economic orderings, um, which continue to perpetuate structuralized, structural and, and racialized violence against citizens. Um, now, just as a brief overview, transformative justice is a process-based approach to justice that locates contemporary trends of injustice, such as political disenfranchisement, economic deprivation, and the criminalization of marginalized populations in a country's historical roots of repression, exclusion, and violence. So we think of these historical roots as through lines, which must be uprooted by transforming socioeconomic structures, state institutions, and relations among citizens um, in order to sever, <clears throat> excuse me, the perpetuation of these harms and improve people's livelihoods. Transformative justice organizers then work to establish local community-based processes of accountability after harm without relying on the very state institutions that tend to cause additional violence through this carceral logic. 
So transformative justice embraces more readily the mandate of both changing societal structures and attitudes to promote harm reduction, <coughs> excuse me, harm reduction and community-based accountability rather than relying on institutions in the name of punishment, punishment um, that fail to, that remove people from society, but fail to deter future acts of violence or address socioeconomic conditions that may contribute to such criminality. So in my remaining time, I just want to highlight these three causal mechanisms I mentioned that underpin this theory of change. And as mentioned, they're resistance, reclamation, and resilience. Now, three points bear emphasis. Uh, first, these mechanisms are contested concepts. Uh, their definitions are certainly not settled within the field. And we also know that more than one mechanism may be present at a time working in the same time and space. Uh, but while they may be present simultaneously, analytically they are distinct and therefore they can explain different phenomena. And then third, the empirical actualization of these mechanisms are deeply contextual and they may vary across and within societies. Uh, still, I propose that they all share one common outcome each one explains how societal engagement with transitional justice translates into deeper demands for structural reforms uh, in ver across various temporal and spatial contexts. So the first is resistance, um, and recent scholarly attention to resistance prove, uh, provides great insight into the motivations and strategies used by actors as they navigate a transitional justice process. Jones and Bernath define resistance as, quote, a purposeful act intended by the actor to work against, prevent, or disrupt the intended or implemented formal transitional justice process. And actors may resist transitional justice processes for a variety of reasons without necessarily dismissing the principles of TJ per se. Um, resistance efforts can also target the ways in which the state attempts to carry out such mandates. Um, so, for example, in the case of Colombia, the state's reluctance in fulfilling the most transformative components of the country's, uh, the country's respective peace agreements is a good example. Um, in this case, there's been state abdication of protecting the social, social leaders on a local level who are arguably the very people who are working to implement the peace accords. And this has provoked societal protests in a post-accord environment. Most notably in July, 2019, thousands of individuals gathered in Bogota and, and throughout Colombia and around the world to participate in uh, calling attention to the state's uh, basically the state's failure to protect uh, the social leaders who have been assassinated since the signing of the 2016 Accords. The second mechanism is reclamation. And this is a particular mechanism of engagement that explains how civil society organizations mobilize to reassert or even expand justice demands um, that may have been previously dismissed or ignored or violated by the state or other actors. So in this context, one way in which reclamation works is by redefining the temporal concerns of transitional justice. Um, it's not only this idea of focusing on remembering the past and uh, accountability for the past, but it is also about current injustices um, in, in, in the present. And some of this work is clearly exemplified by some of the memory-based organizations going on in Chile, uh, which are, are reclaiming the temporal scope of their mission. Um, and in particular, there are two memory centers, uh, such as Londres 38 and Casa Memoria, Jose Domingo Cañas, uh, who have that which have advocated for and, and tried to advance claims of indigenous populations um, and most more specifically the Mapuche uh, and how they've been treated by the state. And this is a stark departure from how um, indigenous groups were considered under traditional transitional justice mechanisms in Chile. And then finally, there's the concept of resilience. Uh, resilience is a concept that is gaining increasing traction within the transitional justice field, especially as it pertains to how such a mechanism can strengthen a community's capacity to rebuild after mass atrocity. Um, so Humbert and Joseph de uh, define resilience as 
uh, ideas of self-organization, adaptation, transformation, and su survival in the face of adversity of crisis. Now, the term itself has received critical scrutiny, right, as it may be utilized even or co-opted by state actors to distribute the weight of responsibility for crisis management to local communities, rather than address maybe the institutional deficits that contribute or even exacerbate crises. Um, but here, I'd like us to think about it as a community's capacity to adapt, organize, or transform space to confront adversity. And more specifically, we may think of how communities may derive resilience from transitional justice initiatives, um, but that transitional justice still does not reflect the practice of transformative justice, which calls for more radical institutional change, such as abolition of the police or of incarceration. And one quick example there is in Brazil, where there are transformative and abolitionist organizations that are advocating for the right to memory, truth, and reparation, but they do not necessarily see these ideas as ends in themselves. Instead, they're a, a, a stop or a part of a pat larger pathway to facilitate a process for deeper reforms and to dismantle the state's carceral logic that disproportionately hurt um, communities of color. I want to wrap up and pass it on to my colleague, Chris, uh, just for us to think about how uh, some of these ideas are, are a preliminary groundwork for a theory of change to understand the different ways people's engagement with transitional justice may inform their demands for a deeper structural approach to justice that re-envisions a different democratic process, uh, maybe a different economic model, and how they are organizing for those claims to be met. Thank you so much. And Chris, uh, I'll pass it on to you. Thank you so much for that. And also to um kind of to, to the organizers of this conference, but, but um, to, to Arnaud, especially for setting out some of the, the themes of the collective at the very um, beginning. And I think this round table fits nicely with some of the themes that were discussed in earlier panels today, um, namely the question of, of post-colonial justice, both as a question of the past and the present. And some, some things before we get into the audience that we might think about is, is why is the effect, or for example, art, or, or the uprisings and these more radical um, demands that Lauren has just mentioned, um, why are they seemingly taking place outside of, of transitional justice places, spaces or, or taking the field by, by surprise? And, and why is transitional justice seemingly unable to grapple with these developments? And here, the answer, or to shed light on this answer, I focus on the audience to help make sense of this. And when conceptualizing justice practices, the audience is often assumed to be categorically, categorically centered around those who would identify um, as, for example, as victims. Or, and, and there's a focus on victimhood and victimization in transitional justice studies. However, as scholars and practitioners, we must reconcile this popular understanding of justice as, as one that obscures the fact that often justice processes serve to reproduce existing power structures rather than actively challenge them. And here there are, there are two main points that can be drawn out of, of this exploration of the audience. And, and one is, is that the vocabulary and epistemology of justice is developed in a way that is purposefully disempowering and silencing. And two, we must look beyond formalized in, and institutionalized justice spaces to understand some of the themes that um, Lauren and Elisa and Arnaud have raised up to this point, such as resistance and importantly, change. And transitional justice studies zoom in on those actors and spaces that actively appropriate for themselves the language, this institutionalized language of transitional justice. However, there are a number of concomitant spaces where justice discourses also play out that some of the previous speakers have also highlighted, such as racial justice, social justice, post-colonial justice, to, to name a few. And in some cases, these spaces intersect and at times even overlap, such as in Canada and parts of the United States that have addressed settler or that are seeking where their demands to address settler colonial violence um, against indigenous communities or black communities through various truth commission efforts. And it's argued that, as Arno mentioned up front, that, that there's, there are these in-between spaces where actors can engage with broader audience that might not see itself as engaged 
directly in transitional justice work. And by definition, non-transitional justice spaces are those spaces where justice crafts takes place, um, where actors engage in confronting injustice and advancing claims to justice outside of these hegemonic discourses of transitional justice, which through an emphasis on the legal and political process, place the onus of making justice in the hands of an elite professional community who may or may not choose to engage with kind of a transnational community um, of, of epistemic experts. Um, however, I guess there's um, okay. So however, by focusing on institutions while ignoring um, how these institutions came to exercise political authority over a given jurisdiction, kind of such as by exploring issues of racial inequality, I, I promise that noise was not coming from, <laughs> coming from here. Um, settle, settle colonialism and legacies of imperialism, transitional justice practice at the very beginning abandons more radical justice craft um, that pursues, um, whereby justice would be pursued beyond kind of what, as mentioned earlier, Nina, Ines Valdez would refer to as neo, more neo-Kantian projects. And this is just to um, give you a capsule summary, would be a paradigmatic understanding of transitional justice where it's assumed, right, the end point of transition is, is, is seen as a given. And it's this kind of this mimicry or this modeling of this model um, of a liberal democratic state. And the section of the audience um, has a, as a subtitle that helps answer the question of how this, this came to be or how these structures emerged. And, and that's the imperial audience. And by privileging transitional justice as legal and technical processes, um, as I mentioned at the outset, is, is an act that un reinforces unequal power relations that are wielded um, within and, and among states. And so the first example of that would be international law, which served as a framework through which colonial harms were addressed. And in the mid 20th century, in the latter half of the 20th century, these settlements took place in the form of elite compromises that, that kind of were formalized in the form of inter interstate treaties that lacked any broad public consultation and are today the subject of, of challenge in, in some of these non-transitional justice spaces. So examples of, of treaties that sought to kind of settle colonial era harms would include, for example, the 1965 Basic Treaty on Relations between Japan and South Korea that was entered into kind of an authoritarian um, were entered in by an authoritarian government in, um, in Korea and also kind of by a Japanese state, neither of which um, engaged in any sort of kind of broader, or had an interest in engaging in any sort of broader understanding of or engagement with um, questions of justice. More recently, though, we can point to the agreement between Germany and Namibia that while including an apology for Germany's um, genocide of the Oberharo and Nama populations and the provision of 1.1 billion euros in development assistance, um, actively eschews the language of, of reparations and follows a general model in which post-colonial reparation is, is the extent that is, is offered is offered in the form of development assistance um, rather than kind of a, a program of acknowledgement. And so also you see this in the form of, of accountability in the form of tribunals. And you can look at Catherine Boo has written about, for example, the, the Tokyo Tribunal, which wrote out colonial era um, abuses um, from the, the prosecutorial mandates in a, in a way to, to not put those other countries that, that were represented um, that, that were in possession of colonies in, in, in a position where um, colonial claims could be, could be challenged. And, and also, if you look at this in a domestic lens, um, you look at trials in the United States relating to civil rights era crimes. Um, these focused on, on, on one hand, they were framed as kind of closing the books on, on crimes of the civil rights era, but they failed to acknowledge any form of state complicity. And in many cases, the, the state was deeply involved or deeply complicit in these crimes to the extent of um, letting violent groups such as the Ku Klux Klan know where civil rights activists were staying um, prior to kind of violent acts being perpetrated against them. But, but unfortunately, due to the, the um, you know, criminal justice system as being one which trials are about determining the guilt or innocence of the accused, not asking kind of these, these, these bigger questions, um, that has fallen outside of these initiatives. And so, Given all of that, um, we can circle back to some of the issues that were raised initially by, by Elisa in relation to art. And you're seeing that in the many different places where, where those who are engaging in struggles for justice aren't appropriating for themselves that language of, that, that elite language of, of transitional justice. In fact, don't see themselves as um, transitional justice practitioners. 
as a way to, to get away from this imperial audience. So I think with that, I will hand over the floor back to Arno. Sorry about this. Um, here we go. Um, thank you so much, Chris, uh, for taking us to this journey into more sort of informal spaces. And um, so what I want to do here in um, closing, all of our participants um, early have sort of explored the um, idea of justice craft, as I defined initially, underlining justice-driven challenges during political change with the goal, among others, of course, to shed light on alternative ways to create space or spaces for more equality or representation when seeking to address wrongdoings and, and injustice. And sort of in closing now, I'd like to turn our focus to initial efforts that capture and map alternative practices by relying on techniques based on the craft of cartography and um, drawing and creating map, maps today is, is very different from earlier craftsmanships, thanks to especially technological advances. And so current geospatial data analysis, for instance, um, integrates now a multitude of data sets. And so not only are we able to uh, pinpoint an exact location, but layers and layers of information, for instance, demographic information can also be added and um, analyzed and interpreted in some forms of uh, visualizations. And so in spite of our ability to capture less visible phenomena, um, thanks to these uh, aforementioned technological advances, we here at the Justice Craft are um, utterly conscious about limitations with regards to the craft of map making. And engaging in the art of cartography here requires all of us to be aware of the especially underlying power relations when drawing maps, right? And so um, needless to say that scholarship or the literature has actively engaged in this, um, um, especially in the 80s and 90s, of course, with, with the emergence of a, a whole field of critical cartography and which in, in recent years has really um, stressed the emancipatory power in the field of, of lesser known voices. And so what we do here, um, when we focus on new actors and with an attempt to disclose less visible themes, we hence shed also light on new contestations, the tensions that arise here, but also hope to show sort of new constellations of power, which help us frame the politics of justice. And I've uh, shared a preliminary sort of map with you here that you can see um, where we try to visualize art related struggles that highlight not only geographical variation of alternative practices, but it also compares it to retributive and restorative justice efforts, right? We see the, the yellow dots are um, basically any sort of art inspired or art related transitional justice processes over time. And uh, we see that these ascent Centers um, are spread across uh, the globe with uh, varying um, incidents, and um, those are captured through um, media articles from, from our data sets. And um, um, we see that other efforts, such as trials, um, are certainly there, and certain trials, for instance, um, as the ICTY or the ICTR. Are, are heavier and bigger circles um, than other trials that might have received less attention, particularly in, in the media. So that said, um, this is just an initial effort where we are trying to um, disclose new and alternative phenomena in regards to political change and using um, sort of justice-oriented um, mechanisms and phenomena 
to sort of promote this idea of, of justice craft. And in concluding, I would really um, like to stress that in order to understand the possibility and the ramifications of transformative change, we need an academic archipelago that embraces an inclusive vision and integrates diverse perspectives and analyzes challenging claims against the backdrop of justice as a political craft. Our collective therefore represents the first step to stake a conceptual path of justice and political change across time and space. We hope that it will serve as a source of inspiration and discussion for building and strengthening a transdisciplinary research agenda. And that said, I will sort of close my remarks and close our discussion roundtable and turn it to our esteemed and dear audience who has been waiting patiently and open up for our Q&A session. Thanks for listening. So are there any comments, questions? We'll give it maybe um, 30 seconds or a minute. Yes, and as Kev said, um, please um, click and raise the hand button. So if we see um, your hands up, then we can certainly turn the mic to you. And I agree, it was quite, uh, we covered quite a lot of ground in our presentations. And as I mentioned earlier, unfortunately, um, many of our um, justice crafters could not make it um, some, for professional reasons, other, unfortunately, for health reasons. So um, we're with them and um, they're on their way to betterment. So and they're, um, yes, um, go ahead, Romo, floor is all yours. Okay, so thank you very much. Sorry, I cannot share my, my, I have a That's problem with my, my video. Okay, thank you very fine. much. No for worries. Fascinating uh, discussions here. I am wondering, um, since the focus of the round table discussion is in critical perspective, perspective I, I wonder if you, if you envision the possibility that uh, to be critical, uh, would include not being critical as a standpoint. So I'm I'm thinking that uh, because when you when you critique, you're assuming you are assuming an analytic or political or moral high horse that kind of standpoint. And since we you talk about justice, national justice. And we can liken justice to history, as they say, history is written by the victors. And so justice in itself is, um, yeah, it's, it's kept by the dominant power, whoever that may be. And um, taking justice from that standpoint, will there be a chance that to be critical would mean not to be critical? Thank, thank you so much. And maybe I'll take a, a 30 second stab to give my justice crafters um, a little bit of time to reflect and to have maybe a more coherent response to this. But I, I'd say, um, Rommel, I, I completely agree with you that um, critical also needs to mean or include and integrate the idea of non-critical, right? And I think what you're, what you're trying to um, allude to here is I think, and I, I hate the use of that term 
normalization, right? It's been overused, um, whether that's with regards to heteronormativity, Eurocentrism, or North American uh, sort of dominance or hegemony with regards to IR theory. Um, I think um, this idea of making the critical that we emphasize so much right now in our expose and in our work, um, to make that as a reference point is really, really important to us. And I hope it came out, we, we have a whole section um, that is called the body, which we were not able to discuss today, but that certainly promotes um, the focus on, on gender and, um, and, and sort of queer, um, overall, and, and I think um, to, to really integrate and create a space, whether that's an in-between space or inside out or outside in space, right, helps us to, um, to bring that at the forefront. And in a way, rendering these lesser known issues more visible is really, really key in our work. And, and um, I'll close my remarks here. Um, for instance, we've listened to, um, to Liza's uh, work on the effect, right? And I think even within our Justice Craft Collective, we have different perspectives of how we embrace art. Um, Eliza really looks at art from a state perspective. How does the state manipulate or use art? And how then um, does art strike back to use sort of a more film or cinematography? graphic um, relation here. And, and so it's, it's, it's interesting because there are tensions. And, and in my own work, I, I do sort of the bottom up art. It's, it's a lot of performances and, and uh, Lauren alluded to civil society and how civil society engages in these different levels. And I think um, they all speak to each other and they couldn't live without each other. And so um, it's really these, um, these tensions and these lesser um, explored phenomena that are at the heart of our critical analysis, which eventually, as you said, ought to be um, less critical and non-critical because it needs to be uh, part of a broader mainstream that we acknowledge and, and also treat. So I'll, I'll pass it on to anyone who, who would like to uh, chime in or have a completely different opinion, of course. I guess. I, I could take the the invitation to <laughs> to have a slightly different um, approach. Um, as as Arno mentioned, it's it, it's very important, right, to to take a broader view of of the subject matter. But I would point out because you'd mentioned that kind of the criticality and um, is kind of on a on, on a high normative force. I think <laughs> right was um, what was mentioned, but at the same time when exploring any of these, these issues, um, attempting to, to do the opposite, right? Kind of being kind of entirely, um, attempting to be positivistic in that, in, in, in that sense is, is in itself a, a normative intervention that, that prevents us from really exploring some of the, the questions that, for example, that I'd wasn't able to really draw out in great detail in discussing kind of the the audience section, but that's that's part of the the silencing that's going on in a sense that um, these these ostensibly neutral frameworks are in themselves not not neutral. I mean, they're they're not neutral. Um, I don't know, Lauren or Elisa, do you have anything? I think just to. Um build on our nose comments and Chris comments, you know, one of the things that we think about in our work when we're in, in conversation with each other is thinking about justice as, you know, motivation, process, outcome, right? But we really emphasize the agency of different actors within that process. So rather than seeing this, this binary even between the global north and the global south or the victor and the vanquished, uh, we understand that often justice processes are much more layered and complex. And in some cases, as I mentioned in the, ca in the case of Colombia, this is a, the peace accords had these big transformative ideas embedded in it. And it was really through state abdication that they're not really following through with them. And you see resistance to the lack of action. Um, so, so I think we all, 
very much appreciate your, you know, your comments. And, and that's always in the back of our minds and, and thinking about who, who are the stakeholders, as Arno mentioned in our introduction, you know, what are their motivations? What are they hoping as part of the outcome? And, and how do the, how does contestation sometimes emerge when we put these different actors in, or when you think about these actors in conversation with each other? I I don't think I have much to add um, on what everyone said because I I think the um, I know Chris and Lauren have addressed it from multiple perspectives except to say that I I really enjoy the kind of epistemological challenge of the question um, which I think is really fundamental um, to absolutely to doing this work to keep in mind and I think one thing as a collective that we really um, you know, spend hours debating and <laughs> discussing. And um, I wish some of the other members were here because there are sections in their paper that really, really respond in our paper that, that, that they've written that really respond um, to this issue. But it's it's always what what we have in the back of our head is is the kind of the struggles, and it's those eternal struggles, whether it be about. Um, critical perspectives, which in my mind is also kind of the um, the criticality of the actual perspectives we're offering as the alternative, as keys, as well as being kind of um, ongoing challenges. And so this this kind of um, yeah, I just I just want to say I really enjoyed this kind of epistemological question because I think it is something that um, we kind of continue to think about and will continue to think about. So thank you so much for raising it. Hey, are there any other questions, comments, suggestions? We're certainly open, not only to critique. Yeah, Talia, please. You might have to unmute yourself, yeah. Are you able to... Um, Hmm. All right. We'll okay. see. Yeah. Perfect. This works. Great. Uh, thank, Go ahead. Thank you. I hope you're not yet sick of me, but um, I'm sorry as well because I, I was a little bit late in the panel, but I think it's a fascinating panel. Um, based on my uh, limited understanding of transitional justice, I'm personally interested in the um, interaction between uh, bottom-up and top-down approaches to TJ and reconciliation. I'm a little bit familiar with the uh, um, uh, TJ and Reconciliation in Timor-Leste, one of my peace building case studies. And there they have this Chega Commission, which was well received and well participated by the local communities. But in the end, this was really not taken by, you know, the political actors or the, the leadership. And in the end, uh, it became more of a political reconciliation between uh, Timorese leadership and Indonesian leadership. I'm wondering if... Um, I'm wondering, based on your uh, project, are there um, governments that are receptive of more of this bottom-up approaches? And uh, if they were receptive, were they able to really um, um, incorporate those um, bottom-up perspectives about TJ into their more uh, uh, national policies when it comes to reconciliation? Thank you. Thank you so much for your comment, Dahlia. Maybe I'll... I'll, I'll throw in sort of a broader comment since I've, I've, I've presented on the conceptual framework um, that helps us also better understand the tension between the bottom up, Dahlia, as you mentioned, and sort of the, the top down. And um, I think a lot of the TJ processes and the field itself was very much state-centric and state-driven, right? I think even the UN definition of transitional justice is about how governments um, that have succumbed to or that have experienced past wrongdoings or uh, political um, and um, other related violence, how they deal with this, right? And I think what we here at the Justice Craft Collective are trying to do is to look beyond this. We certainly embrace the, um, the interaction between different stakeholders, whether they are grassroots or whether they're from international organizations. Um, Mariam Salehi, who is not here today, um, really talks about these TJ experts and how 
knowledge production and creation is really affected by these different layers. And I think um, what's most important to us here is really to make sure that the spaces that are lesser explored, whether that is the bottom up or whether that's also a space that might be more informal, um, be become, become the center of our scholarly initiatives and exploration, right? And so I, I think that's something we need to, we need to think about and, and again, put this more on the front burner and, and again, for the lack of a better word, try to mainstream this, right? Make a trend out of highlighting and shedding light onto um, areas that are lesser explored and also lesser institutionalized. Because as you mentioned, you said that in, in your in the Ache Peace process that, that there was like this very local and community driven effort that was then not acknowledged. And my own research in Tunisia certainly speaks volumes about this. And, and uh, Mariam can also speak to that since she just published a book on this. Um, and so I think, um, I think with that, maybe I, I can turn it to my, my fellow justice crafters since they also have, have a lot of case studies to, to respond to you. And if I correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, you also um, have worked on, on, on issues regarding um, to, to the peace process there. So that, that might also be a good, good segue here. I guess I can go, <laughs> I guess. Next, I mean, without, without firsthand really with knowledge of, of East Timor, I just like want to say that the, one of the things that, that struck me when thinking about this project and kind of interacting with colleagues is, is that when you think about kind of the struggle, the tension between the bottom or bottom up and top down um, approaches that in every kind of context in which kind of we write about or we talk about transitional justice, you'll see kind of, you'll, you'll see scholarship about the instrumentalization of, of justice by elites or um, terms like hijacked justice that Yelena Subotic introduced first in, in the Balkans. And this, it, it, and it seems that this, 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 this is illustrative of the fact that as you move more into institutionalized spaces, you're operating on a kind of unequal playing field, one that privileges the elites and which, which gives the elites the tools, the vocabulary, the mechanisms, the institutions and the frameworks to, to instrumentalize. Um, and so when thinking about bottom up, justice, um, looking at these other spaces or these spaces that don't necessarily use this, this language allows us potentially to see actors that are doing more interesting, <laughs> hopefully more interesting things. Um, but that's kind of a, just a, um, a, a broader conceptual answer. Um, I think, Lauren, you, you talk about a lot of cases in where you see some of this kind of this friction, right? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I agree with absolutely what Arno and, and Chris said about these tensions and, and how we think about the way the state might instrumentalize um, these transitional justice tools and maybe the, the reactions or counter reactions um, from the population and, and how they engage or how they might interpret these processes. Um, in my own work and some of the field work I did in Chile, it's sort of it was sort of fascinating visiting these different memory centers, and it seemed like the less they were funded by the state, the more open they could be about challenging current human rights violations, right? Where they only they didn't just focus on uh, the legacy of the Pinochet dictatorship, uh, and and maybe if, if it was a former detention center that had now turned into this memory and, and education center. Um, the ones that seemed less funded by the state were also the ones that were much more aggressive in challenging current abuses that are happening like in, in, in um, prisons, right? Or uh, when people are not uh, serve due process within the criminal justice system because they're they're connecting the linkages between the past and the present. And so I do think that when we think about top down versus bottom up, we could think about the different ways um, groups or movements might become uh, less constricted in their agenda because they're not necessarily beholden to certain donors, right? Or certain mandates that might be articulated by people in power, right? It's not always the case, but it is something to think about or question. 
And I think if I can just chime in at the end here, um, you, you know, it, it's in my work, what I find really interesting between this kind of dichotomy between top down and bottom up, that's often, um, you know, it's pervasive throughout transitional justice mechanisms and institutions. It's really interesting that art and artists kind of um, exist at both levels and kind of poke holes at both levels and resist being co-opted um, and incorporated by um, you know, governments in some way. So even if it's government sponsored or state sponsored art, um, the ability of art to kind of um, some art, of course, not all art, but I'm, I'm speaking as a general as a general way to kind of um, you know get continually kind of question what's actually going on and the kind of um, justice that they're being kind of um, disseminated as part of um, is really important. It's like um, the, you know, kind of I guess a visual conscience. Um, in, in some scenarios that can kind of challenge this bottom up, um, top down divide. So I just wanted to add that at the end. Thank you so much for the question. Terrific, Eliza. And then I, I think um, you really rounded that up with a, a medium that certainly has not found enough attention in transitional justice studies. I mean, more so in the in, in more recent years, but um, you also have um, a great um, track record on that. And um, so here, um, I'll do a little shout out. Anyone that is interested um, should, oops, it, it doesn't appear um, due to the green screen, but uh, Eliza has a recent book, The Justice of Visual Art. So anyone that is um, tempted should certainly uh, pick that up. Um, it is with, um, 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 a lovely um, press, uh, Cambridge, and so um, it is. It is very um, detailed and compelling, and and um, some of the imagery that you've seen in today's presentation um, evolves also around the uh, South African Constitutional Court. So um, please, by all means, um, if that um, piqued your interest, um, that is a, a fascinating read. Um, any other? questions. We have uh, a few more minutes. It's great. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm very saddened by the fact that we don't have all our panelists, but um, on the other hand, or the upside is um, we don't have to rush um, and, and time is not against us here. So it's nice to have a conversation. Um, I see um, Rommel has his hand up again, by all means. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. So uh, uh, I'd like to build upon the dichotomy between the top-down and the bottom, bottom-up approach, but take it to a different direction. This time, I, uh, Lauren, for example, highlight the agency. And Chris mentioned about the represented, the representer and the represented. And Eliza, yeah, talk about the effect. So I was wondering that we can take the, the, the um, top-down approach by looking into the position of us scholars. When we do analysis, we are essentially have this kind of uh, uh, in in what I can consider as called the intellectualist bias. So we we have the panoptical view of everything. We can see everything. So in a broad uh, range. So uh, from, the stand, from the standpoint of the people on the ground, however, so people doing day-to-day -day life. So they, they, they might understand the idea, for example, of justice differently than, than what we do as far. So I wonder um, their, their affect, their feeling towards uh, what is just and what is not. It, it, it may be different. And so we try, we scholars will try to always look into the, we always try to, to give voice, agency to, the, to those people on the ground. But uh, they might, the, things are very complex on the ground. So often enough, they, their idea of justice might be different from what we consider the scholars having seen it all. Uh, maybe Different. So I, I wonder how do you how do you deal with this kind of uh, this kind of 
disconnect, this kind of challenge. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you so much, uh, Rommel, for your, for your comment. And um, in, in an effort to switch it up a little and not always have Eliza go last, right? And especially since it, it talks about emotive spaces. And I think Eliza grappled uh, with this, this question of, um, because the, the state promoting public art and, and who goes to a museum, right? Or who goes to the constitutional court. And so maybe you can say a few things um, within your case study or beyond, right? Because you certainly uh, grapple in your own research with that. And then we'll go through, um, maybe Lauren has um, something else to add, um, and Chris and, and uh, I'll be last this time if, if, if that's okay with everyone. Thanks, Sando, and thanks for, all for, your, for another great question because I think with your questions today, you're kind of really getting at the heart of exactly what we're trying to challenge um, and, and the, the difficulties we come across as scholars um, doing this kind of work. And our kind of aim as the Justice Craft Collective is to really kind of um, f flip on its head this understanding of justice and how we get to an understanding of of different justices um, and grapple with that. And so what I guess we're trying to do is look at the, the different spaces um, in, in which we can see different social actors, um, you know, kind of um, doing different things and, and making claims to justice and claims to political representation um, in, in ways that kind of perhaps transitional justice hasn't um, grappled with or taken seriously enough, or, or at least we, uh, I, I think um, as a collective, we would advocate that they haven't taken seriously enough. So that's what we're trying. So that's exactly what we're trying to challenge. Um, and I, I think this, the, their, um, the continuing divide between kind of top down and bottom up and um, um, people on the ground and people implementing transitional justice is, is exactly what we are kind of um, trying to move away from and trying to, to tackle by looking at these different spaces. I mean, so in my own work, um, you know, I take very seriously, as I'm sure you've gathered, art and artistic interventions as kind of ways of understanding um, different claims for recognition and different ways to acknowledge um, people who have really been uh, deeply affected um, by conflict and that perhaps aren't, um, you know, represented in um, or whose voices don't appear in, um, like, reports by Truth and Reconciliation Commissions. And so I'll just give an example, as, as Anu mentioned, of, of one artwork, for instance, the, the Constitutional Court. And there, there are layers to this, because as Anu mentioned, it's, it's you know, I'm to I'll talk about an artwork at the Constitutional Court who, um, which looks at sexual violence against women and that in South Africa under, under apartheid. And that is something that um, the, the kind of the history of that and the recognition of how pervasive uh, that was and how it was used very um, used differently under and the kind of ramifications of that under apartheid um, is, is ostensibly something that's missing considerably from South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission report. So the artwork by virtue of hanging in the constitutional court becomes this alternative archive and an alternative record um, of voices um, that are absent and experiences that are absent. But as Arno said, then, then there's that added layer of, well, who attends this venue to actually um, see this particular artwork. And so what I found in doing field work there, for instance, was this particular artwork um, became a form of judicial consciousness. Um, and that's not a term I came up with. That is something that the actual uh, judges who I interviewed at the court um, continually spoke about. I'm talking, I should actually mention the, the title of the artwork I'm talking about. It's Judith Mason's um, The Man Who Sang and the Woman Who Kept Silent. Um, the more commonly known title for this is, is The Blue Dress. Um, and so it's interesting, therefore, that then the kind of representation of these voices that are missing from um, formal transitional justice mechanisms, how they become heard and how they kind of um, become part of the kind of, I guess, the more broader constitutional justice of South Africa going forward. Um, so there are many parts to that, but I'm also conscious, conscious that I um, don't want to take up too much time as we're rapidly running out of time. So I'll, I'm going to mute myself now and, and pa pass it over to Lauren. <laughs>
Thank you. Um, I'll be very quick too. I think, you know, it, it's a personal question, which I really appreciate, right? I think we all approach our work with a certain level of humility and understanding. We're asking really big questions and just trying to provide maybe a little bit of a window of, of looking at these questions in, in different, from, from different perspectives, right? And wrestling with them and learning from our colleagues. Um, you know, from my work as a political scientist, I think one way uh, our our little collective is is trying to move the field forward is that for a long time transitional justice was associated with these very limited political transitions and i think there's been a lot of scholarship that have tried to blow that uh very artificial framework of what constitutes transition open and we're sort of continuing along with that trend right and thinking about instead of um thinking about this idea of justice being associated just with a, a moment of a regime change or the signing of peace accords, we're moving beyond that to think about the long lasting legacies of how these questions uh, continue to ruminate, like how people continue to ruminate over these questions in the long term. Uh, again, we're just sort of adding our little analyses, right, to this larger contribution. Um, so, you know, it's something that we wrestle with. And we also know that we're, we're limited, right? We're always asking questions, going back into our own work and thinking about how um, we might approach, you know, some of our, our previous analyses differently and, and, and thinking about it in new ways. Uh, but I'll leave it at that and turn it to Chris. Yeah, thanks. And, and thank you so much, Rommel, for the question. It's a, it's a very important one. And it's one that draws attention to the to the fact that we, we should be careful not to um, make assumptions about what we think justice is. And, and just one small point that I, that I would add is, is one that many other scholars have, have also observed in relation to um, those NGOs that are, that are working in transitional justice that, that are ostensibly local NGOs. But then if you, if you look more closely, um, often those NGOs that, that, that are, are successful in getting funding are the NGOs that are using the language in the discourse of of transitional justice that's kind of already been professionalized or institutionalized. Um, grant writing processes require people who are kind of fluent perhaps in, in French or, or in English. Um, and therefore, even, even those interlocutors who might on the one hand kind of be perceived as kind of communicating kind of what, what local perceptions of justice are, it's already been in a way um, transformed or co-opted um, by virtue of Kind of these various mechanisms that that both Lauren and and Elise have pointed to, but I'll I'll just leave it at that and hand over to Arno. Thank you so much. And in the minute or two that's that's left here, I wanted to um, point out to a question uh, that um, I think Akil Ninja Capistrano had with uh, regards to TJ and indigenous um, societies, the civilizations that have been dispossessed of their ancestral domains. And I think that is a, a key question that, um, for instance, here, um, where, where Lauren and I are from in the US um, with regards to uh, native or indigenous uh, people and land claims is very much on the front burner. And so, yes, there is a lot of scholarship um, on that issue and also emerging scholarship. And in closing, I just wanted to reiterate what, what my justice crafters have really underlined um, so eloquently. And that is, um, we're, we're not looking so much at the critical. Yes, um, we, 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 we raised the question in our title, but I think it's more so inner and transdisciplinary, right? We, we really try to include different disciplines, whether that's law or the arts, um, whether that's sociology, political science, geography, right? The mapping, the critical mapping, is a great example how we are grappling with different technology and, and concepts. And in that sense, I think what, what Lauren has highlighted is sort of going into different time and different contexts or spaces, how we call it, really to promote this idea of justice craft, right? This is something in the long time we really want to understand the social and political change and how justice is affected by the communities and people from within. And that's certainly a very complex process and um, it's challenging, 
but um, at least we're not out of a job. So uh, we have job security and that's certainly something um, that is very important in our times of uncertainty. And I'll close it on that note. And I'm um, sorry if we didn't get to all the questions, we could certainly um, talk a lot more. Reach out to us, um, we're very approachable. We'd love to hear your thoughts, any comments or suggestions. And thank you again so much to the organizers, um, Kevin, for, for really guiding us through here. It's, it's worked beautifully with regards to the technology. And you guys have a wonderful um, rest of the conference and um, take care and see you hopefully soon again in person. Thank you again. And thanks my fellow justice crafters. Bye everybody. <laughs>